consider supporting Archaea Soup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in video description. Thank you. Good morning, Professor Chris Hunt. Good morning. Good morning. Now, this is the third time I've said good morning to you, because I keep on getting this wrong. <laughs> so, uh, to be to be quick and brief, welcome to this chat. And I would like to know more about a news story that, uh, that I recently came across your name in. It's a news story linked with a cave that I've always been fascinated by, Shanadar Cave, where some Neanderthal remains were found. And historically... I thought sort of the book was somewhat inconclusively but nonetheless closed on this cave as a potential site for very relatable human behaviour, potentially Neanderthals burying Neanderthals. Uh, but in this particular article, obviously I'll link to it below, uh, you have been reassessing these remains and what I found interesting when I first reached out to you was that you were at great pains to... to highlight that perhaps things aren't quite so simple as some people would like them to be. So can we just sort of begin by just uh, just introducing, I suppose, yourself and also how you got involved in the Shanadar cave remains? Okay, um, I'm a archaeopalynologist, geoarchaeologist uh -huh, um, uh -huh. by training and in inclination. I've worked around the world for the last 40 odd years yeah. and one of the things I've done a great deal of is work in caves okay. um, because I find the challenges of cave excavation fascinating and because enormous amounts of work were done in caves in the time up to the mid 20th century very often there's no discernible science associated with that partly no. because um, science as we now know it in archaeology had hardly developed mm. at that time and um, partly because some of the people involved actually had very little scientific training um, or had a completely different scientific training as in the case of Tom Harrison who dug at Nia who was a great mm. biologist but when he started breaking ground in at Nia knew absolutely nothing about archaeology no no yeah um, so very often there are big stories associated with these long sequences of human activity that you can see in caves. They were places where people did all sorts of really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're places where you've basically got an umbrella so that erosion doesn't carry away remains and all the associated goodies, as it were, mm -hmm. as would happen in, op in an open air site. Mm. So I think they're absolutely great places to do archaeology, but they are very, very challenging. And I've well, spent a lot of time looking at things like taphonomy in yes. caves yeah. to well, and, understand some of those challenges. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing, because I suppose even though it's an umbrella, it comes with its own challenges in terms of understanding, exact, as you say, the taphonomy, what happens after that material is part of that site, how those layers build up, exactly what the internal... It's almost like its own erosion... Uh, biodome, if you want to call it that, it's, a, it's own erosion sort of uh, uh, um, sphere of influence that presumably introduces its own complications. And 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 in this particular instance, in this cave, uh, the, 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 there's a very a very bold statement was made or has been made over the years that that potentially inclusions or intrusions into certain layers may indicate burial and we're talking about in this instance about the the remains of flowers found in and amongst neanderthal remains now when i was studying this cave some people were saying well this possibly was a collapse on top of remains and actually the flowers are in are an intrusion through rodent activity and this kind of thing and so how how, how do you start to unpick this question and all of these complicated matters and also out of that infer behavior of these people when they were alive Again, well, there's, there's uh, several PhD theses rolled up in that question. <laughs> uh, brilliant question. So I'll try and unpick some of it. Um, firstly, 
we've been into the archives, mm -hmm. um, which are at Columbia, at the Smithsonian, where they're doing an immense job at the moment of sorting the Selecki archive. Mm. Um, one of my colleagues actually visited the Selecki's at home when part of that archive was in their basement to go through it with them. Right. And so the first thing is simply to try and understand the documentary records which they had generated, mm. which to some extent or other support the patterns that they've talked about. Yes. Um, to try and understand where things were in what was an absolutely enormous excavation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Selecki went down 15 meters near yeah. enough. Um, at the top, the trench is at least eight by five meters. Mm -hmm. uh, plus there's a certain amount of collapse and small, if you like, side apses mm -hmm. um, in what was originally a sort of oblong. And so an immense volume of material was removed from that hole. And these records are you know, the best clue as to where stuff was. Yeah. And he's published some of the photographs, but not all of them. No. He's not published a great deal of the detailed locational information that right. he recorded. Um, I think the volume of stuff that he had to deal with was sort of simply so great yeah. that it sort of be was too much mm -hmm. for what was basically a lone scientist. Yeah. Um, albeit Rose was a fantastic archaeologist in her, in her own right mm. and extremely well organized. So there, there's this amazing um, repository now, mostly at the Smithsonian, um, which basically has to be the starting point because you've got to understand what people were up to mm -hmm. um, in terms of the excavation and where stuff was. And then we've been tracing down from the surface the walls of the old excavation trench. Mm -hmm. We've only cleared out about half of it, so there's vast amounts of shoring holding back the back dirt on the other side. Mm. Um, but we concentrated on the areas where there was maximum Neanderthal, if you see what I mean. Maximum Neanderthal. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a good phrase. About it. Yep. And we've been lucky enough to find bits of Shanidar 5, uh -huh. and it's very clear from Emma Pomeroy's very detailed analysis of the skeletal material there that we were finding the other end of that partial skeleton right. that had been found by Selecki. Okay. Um, and putting that into a, a modern sedimentary context type understanding. Um, it's a, a very battered series of remains. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't lie in anything that you can obviously call a grave cut. No. Now, Selecki talks, if you read in detail his notes, about some of these being burials and others being places where somebody came to rest, perhaps under a rock fall, and then, for instance, he talks about a cairn being built on top of, in one case. Um, so simply trying to understand the surfaces on which these individuals came to rest and then what happened thereafter to them is fundamental to trying to understand the processes leading to their deposition. It has to be. And that involves these days a whole range of all sorts of complicated geoarchaeological stroke forensic type analyses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Detailed examinations of the bones, for instance, to look for whether breaks were um, while the individual was alive or mm -hmm. recently dead or long dead mm -hmm. um, on one side. And on the other side, looking very carefully at stratification, at whether, for instance, body fluids had escaped into stratification, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of detail, if you like, microarchaeology yeah. around those. But yeah. also, in the bigger context, trying to understand the stratigraphic relationship between the bodies and the events that have led to the deposition of material. Um, well, and not, not least because it, just then you've sort of described various and disparate potential burial practices. 
So the notion of active burial, incidental burial, memorialization through a cairn, these are different. These are different. These are not necessarily uh, activities that all would happen at once through from the same culture. And so, I guess in that sense, are you? Does one have to make a decision as to which? which practice you're trying to f understand or is it just a case of you literally just just going layer by layer and then eventually you will try and understand the story the taphonomy and out of that will come some sort of st understanding or tentative statement about cultural behavior yeah i think it's got to be the latter you've yeah. got to read the evidence and yeah. you can't go in with preconceptions and one of the problems that we have is that a word like burial yeah. which Selec use quite liberally, mm. um, has come to mean something in Paleolithic archaeology, which mm -hmm. is really very specific about cutting a hole, placing a body in it and covering it. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that that's easy to demonstrate, but you've got to do your best. Yeah. To just simply see what was going on. Mm. And the Neanderthals were obviously extremely resourceful, they mm -hmm. were around for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. They were pretty smart. Um, whether you can compare them in any way to people like us, we have a lot more culture, mm -hmm. but they had the great ability to survive in immensely difficult environments. And varied um, environments as well, yeah. It's becoming mm. clear that they're, they are associated with behaviors like um, using birds, mm -hmm. um, in ways which are clearly not to do with food, mm -hmm. but might be to do with ornament. Mm -hmm. There are cases where they are associated with things like pierced shells, for instance, in some of the work that, of Zilhau. Mm -hmm. um, so these are quite complicated people. And mm. most recently, in terms of sort of big deal Neanderthal stuff, I guess, is the spotting of cave art and the dating of that by Alistair Pike and his colleagues to long before modern humans got into Europe. Mm, so mm. these are not, if you like, nasty, brutish and short. They're much more complicated than that. Yeah. And they were around for an immense amount of time. Mm -hmm. When you think that most of our, if you like, civilization, if you want to use that word, arose in 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. They were around for 200,000 or more years, depending way, how you define a Neanderthal. <laughs> Yeah. And some of their genetics are in us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you would expect a vast range of behavior because there's a vast amount of time and because they were widely distributed geographically yeah. and were extracting resources in all sorts of different environments. I, I, I'm reminded of, uh, was it last year or the year before, there was a story coming out of South Africa where there had been... Uh, some remains, I think oscillopithecines, were seemingly seemingly going into a cave deep underground and posting remains through essentially a letterbox into a, a cavern that they couldn't access. And uh, the, the, this, 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 this find is still being interrogated That's and understood. That's the Homo Nadelli. Um, exactly, yes, yes. One of my colleagues here is, is working on some yeah. of that. And and it's interesting how how whenever a story like this comes about, that story, or for example, the Shanadar when I was a, when I was a student, the conversation very quickly becomes people become quite emotive about it. They because they, uh, because because for some reason the, the the mirror image that we see in that what we consider to be very uh, human with a Homo sapien H behaviour uh, is somehow unnerving to some people. Um, and it sounds as though as though you're uh, you're not tr it's not it's not that you, as you say you're not wanting to make it necessarily make a statement or have a an opinion about it or in indeed as it were dehumanize these humans because in many ways they had very recognizable and also very specific behaviors to their own uh, species and culture. But what but wh why do you think it is that that so many people feel the need to make a judgment about? essentially mortuary culture when it comes to non-homo non sapien humans uh, and why is it so important in so much as if if they're disposing of their dead in a way which is archaeologically invisible that's still a cultural behavior why, why are we sort of judging people by that standard in that sense i mean it's very similar to language as well isn't it we get very caught up on whether or not neanderthals had an, a fully formed language in the same way that, that we do 
but you can communicate in other ways. Why do we need them to either be or not be us, do you think? I, I find that a very difficult question to address in many ways mm. because um, there's no reason why they should be us, no. but they might have enormous complexity of behaviour um, of their own on their own right. And I think one of the interesting things to think about here is observations by people like Rob Foley mm -hmm. and Chris Stringer recently that if you look at the mortuary behavior of something like chimpanzees, it's very, very complex. Mm -hmm. You get um, bereaved mothers carrying around their infants yeah. for long, long periods of time, 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, you get them covering remains mm -hmm. with branches and so forth on occasion. You get other times when they basically just leave them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole range of behaviors in a, in a in, in chimpanzees. And if they could do it, it mm -hmm. suggests that somewhere in our common ancestry, um, similar behaviors might have been operating, in mm -hmm. which case it would be stupid not to expect Neanderthals to be doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the key here is range of behavior over immense periods of time. Mm -hmm. And amongst that, you're likely to get all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the, th the problems with Homo sapiens is that it tends to other even parts of its own species. Yeah. Um, and so you get despicable behavior, in my view, about mm -hmm. things like race and gender and sexual orientation mm -hmm. um, and all sorts of other strange things. Um, at the moment, we have young people running around in the streets stabbing each other because they're not part of the same group. Mm. Um, so somewhere deep in our psyche, for some people, there might be this sense that we are special and everything else is not special. Mm. And this, in a sense, might justify certain types of behavior. Mm. So I think the whole thing is very loaded and very difficult. Mm. Um, as a subject, and somebody like me, who basically was trained as a scientist rather than a social scientist, mm -hmm. um, really isn't the best equipped to go into it in, in any depth. Mm -hmm. But I do think that what we have to do is simply look very carefully at the evidence and document it as best we can. And well, in a sense, it then becomes almost for other commentators to take what we find mm -hmm. and interpret it. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, people like Paul Pettit, who are much more experienced at understanding some of these things, um, are the sort of people that are likely to be able to give a much more authoritative view once we've presented the evidence. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I often, I've often thought that that uh, lots of my archaeological colleagues, myself included, some, we, sometimes we feel a little bit separated from some of our fellow humans, and, and, and that helps in so much as you're able to, to look a bit more objectively at behaviour. Uh, and I think this also applies to, to, to other, for example, social scientists who I know as, as well. Um, but it also means that, the, as you say, people, for example, your focus is exactly the right one to have when simply trying to re... Well, uh, I've often had it described and often described myself, you know, an excavation is the, the present that you can't rewrap. You know, it's a one one shot deal. You destroy the site as you go. But it sounds as though by having this, this, this approach as to what is the microstratigraphy, what is the, the taphonomy of the site, you've also been very fortunate in being able to find the other end of half recovered skeletons in the ballast of that excavation. Uh, and be able to sort of try and piece together these these things that other people then can interrogate to, to infer behaviour. Uh, what for you then has been uh, so far has been interesting in examining then this this this, this the, the facts of the site, the microstratigraphy. Are, are you are you seeing anything that you weren't expecting? Are you seeing anything that 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 was that intrigues you? Um, I, I'm also aware, obviously, that work is ongoing, so it's not like you can make a final statement. But what 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 what's coming out of this work then if we put you know statements about behavior to one side um well the whole thing is fascinating it's probably the most difficult cave i've ever worked in uh -huh. um, both logistically and in terms of actually trying to understand what was going on yeah um and it's taken us several years of simply careful scraping of sections and looking mm 
mm. to really start to get to grips with the sedimentary processes, for instance. Yeah. And it, it's a cave with a very violent, if you like, geological history, mm -hmm. um, with immense rock falls, which have distorted sediments, with great mud flows, with what appear to be enormous outbursts of water from presumably melting snow or similar right. um, in various layers. It's absolutely, mm -hmm. if, if you, I'm not particularly religious, but you could use the word miraculous uh -huh. to describe the fact that actually stuff has remained and yeah. that the Neanderthal remains are still there, yeah. given the violence of the processes. Yeah. So I think that is one of the fascinating things. Mm -hmm. um, we're begin beginning to get a sense that people were only able to exploit the environment around the cave during times when it was relatively warm, so uh -huh. interstadials and similar warm periods um, are probably when most of the people were there. Mm. And that's both Neanderthals and the later modern humans. Yeah. Um, Selecki, in his illustrations, produces summary sections. Mm. And actually, when we've gone back and looked at them, it's quite difficult to see how he conceptualized them. Mm. The stratigraphy that we're seeing is infinitely more complicated than his published versions mm. um, and he did things like measure down from datums whereas actually the stratigraphy slopes quite violently in places mm. this was a cave which was partly excavated by erosion by mm. gullying at least a couple of times mm. so there are wedges of sediment older sediment with younger sediments sitting on top of Mm -hmm. um, and beside, as it were. Mm. And all of that makes actually understanding where things come from quite difficult, mm -hmm. particularly once you move away from the section edges and out into this central void of his excavation trench. At mm. times, that must have been a very, very active routeway for sediment, for mud flow and for water flow. Yeah. And there's evidence that drainage within the cave actually reversed um, at some point, probably around MIS-4. Um, so it's a spectacular story right. in sedimentary terms. Uh -huh. um, we're beginning to recover pollen, um, which was my particular sort of starting point and why uh -huh. I'm particularly keen to be involved in this cave. Yeah. Um, and the pollen isn't exactly the same as the accounts from Arlette Lirio Gohan, who right. was a great palynologist. She was probably the leading figure in archaeopalynology uh -huh. for 30 or 40 years in the middle and late 20th century. A great mm -hmm. woman with the most astounding brain, great observation skills. Um, and we're still trying to explore why that might be. We've done quite a lot of taphonomic work with the pollen. And I had a great PhD student, Marta Fiaconi, who did a lot of that. Um, but now in the layers around the Shanidar for burial. Um, and I think there we can sort of use the word burial, um, although Selecki never saw a cut. I hasten to say that. No. And so it's still contentious. Yeah. Um, we're beginning to get results which are interesting, but not quite what I expected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's life, I guess. Um, <laughs> We're also yep. finding sorts of other things. And for instance, there's quite a lot of archaeological starch, dispersed starch in some of the layers associated with some of the Neanderthal bodies. Right. Um, so we're going to get a much better idea of what they were eating. Uh -huh. um, the group up at the other university in Liverpool who do the, the paleobotany are finding really interesting remains amongst the charred material. So again, we, we will have a much, much better understanding of the plant foods. On the animal well, bone side, it looks like well, basically so they're just, eating ibex. Can I just stop just, just briefly there, before we move on to animal bones? So are, are you able then, if there are charred layers and starch and stuff, are you able to, to, to talk about, or, no sorry, are, would that indicate occupation layers then? I think at least short-lived occupation layers. Right. Um, lower down in the cave, around the Shanidar 4 layer, uh -huh probably longer and more intense occupation than later, where it right. seems to have been very ephemeral. Yes. Um, 
we're beginning to see evidence of seasonality uh -huh. and it looks like very short visits um, with quite long periods of time between visits. Okay, and, um, and do, do the animal bones indicate seasonality at all? Or? The, there's the beginnings of an indication of that. We haven't right. really got enough yet to be absolutely no. sure. No. But um, there's people at Cambridge working hard on the animal bone, and uh -huh. so hopefully some of that will come out in the wash. Yes. Um, what we're dealing with largely is material probably about this big on average. It's mm -hmm. tiny, it's bashed, smashed and processed to death. Yeah. Um, they were working their, their animal foods very, very hard mm. to get every bit of nutrition out of them as far as one can see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so I'm very aware that I interrupted you there because you were mentioning ibex and other things. So what, what, what were you going to say about, about the, the fauna then? Well, at the moment, the main ungulate in the, the neighbourhood is ibex. We yeah. get very close to them. And... I've always wondered how animals as smart as ibex could be caught by people who didn't have projectile weapons. Mm -hmm. But actually, there have been times when members of our group have been wandering around in the landscape on days off um, and have come very, very close to ibex. Mm -hmm. They have root ways and you could hide next to one and probably ambush one. Yeah. Um, but it would be jolly hard work. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And they were eating a variety of other smaller animals as well. Yeah. Um, it's very clear. So, you know, it's, there's a lot still to come out of that. And once the formal studies are complete, we'll have a much better idea. Um, but, you know, these were people who were working extremely hard yeah. to maintain themselves in that landscape. Um, they clearly brought myth material for lithics from some distance because there are no good um, cherts in the local geology and the local limestone is pretty soft yeah. um, and wouldn't have made decent lithics. Um, so you know, they're somewhere towards the edge of a range, one would mm -hmm. think, and that's presumably because they're in the Zagros. They're not very high up, but um, they could have use this place as a staging post as they went into the high Zagros following for instance animals up hills and down and as climate changed then you would expect Shanidar's position in a long distance migration mm -hmm. um, to change yeah. at times it might have been a summer at times it might have been winter and we'll a lot of these things will have will probably be quite specific to layer by the yeah. time we've actually disaggregated them. Okay, okay. So a again, it sounds as though th there's more work to be done, and, and you're you're going through it very methodically. And that you know, it, I, I'm I'm sim simultaneously fascinated by, but also don't envy the process. Um, but uh, it also sounds very clear that 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 you've you have a an immense respect for the, these 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 as nearly said, creatures there, sorry, these fellow humans, um, but also as well that, that you don't want to mischaracterize or overstate their behaviors. I mean, how, uh, just, just, I suppose, briefly, how would you describe your impression of these people? Like, if, if you, would you want to meet them if you could, for example? Um, I would probably be fascinated to meet them. Uh -huh. um, I might be quite nervous, um, <laughs> you know, because... They obviously were incredibly physically powerful. Yeah. Um, I have enormous respect for them, which actually goes back to work I did in the 80s at Creswell, where mm -hmm. we were coming across bones of hyenas. And the, the, the um, cave hyena at Creswell was as, as big as a, a reasonable pony. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It was a very big, substantial animal with the mm. most enormous teeth yeah. um, that would bite its way through, for instance, hippopotamus thigh bones. Yeah. Um, so really serious predator. Uh -huh. And yet, somehow, Neanderthals got into the Creswell Caves mm -hmm. and were in them. Whether that meant they displaced the hyenas or they were actually alternating with them is not clear because... Um, most of the vital evidence was quarried away in the 19th century. Mm. But um, clearly, these were very, very 
redoubtable people. And yeah. everything we see at Shanidar tells us the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think probably our own human ancestors, if you like, the people that came out of Africa and provide most of our genetics, must have been equally redoubtable. Mm -hmm. um, but probably in a slightly different way. Yeah. Maybe slightly less to do with explosive activity and more to do with endurance type activity. Yeah. Um, so, but I've always got on with whoever I've met, wherever I've been in the world. So it would be wonderful to have the chance with a Neanderthal. Unfortunately, yeah. it's never going to happen. No, no. No, it, and it's interesting as well. I, I'm really uh, quite, I like the fact, I'm really quite pleased to hear you describing our differences as as you say, explosive is an endurance. Uh, some people I've, I've had conversations with are tempted to talk about, you know, Neanderthals, for example, lacking foresight or long, long term planning and this kind of thing. And when you look at other behaviors and, for example, things like Cresswell Crags and, and, and you know, uh, in northern Germany and across, it's clear that no, Neanderthals must have been must have had planning. And as you say, if they're moving from through the landscape, following animals, stopping off at places like Shanadar, you don't just accidentally do that so so it's interesting that 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 i think the more thoughtful uh descriptions of Neand the differences between neanderthals and modern humans tend to talk about uh, well again behaviors and f ways of tackling the same problem as opposed to whether or not they were capable of tackling the same problem mm. i think increasingly we're moving towards that and and um, and just briefly for, for folks at home who may not know, I mean, for example, this this notion of of explosive activities. I mean, what, one of the juvenile skeletons infamously was compared to people like Rafa Nadal in terms of musculature. These people were incredibly muscular, and it would have been, um, yeah, would have been interesting to meet them. I'm not sure I'd want to get into an arm wrestling match with them though. <laughs> I think that's probably right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> they dislocate your shoulder definitely. Um, well, it's been a real pleasure, Chris. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, just briefly before before I let you go, is there anything, um, if you had the chance or or that that you ever sort of reflect upon that you would like people to know know more about when it comes to, especially, uh, for example, palynology or in this instance maybe even Neanderthals? What what if you could? What's a little tidbit that you could share with people that's not specifically just about what we're talking about today? Well, um, I'm sort of entranced by the depth of time of human behavior of all mm -hmm. sorts. Um, I also occasionally work as a forensic palynologist, mm -hmm. um, dealing with police cases of one sort or another. Um, and although I'm a scientist by training and a palynologist by first training, Mm -hmm. I've worked with and around archaeologists for a, a great length of time. And I think what I'm now trying to do is understand the behavior of humans and their relations mm -hmm. through looking at the evidence that they leave behind it as near as anything in a sort of forensic way. Mm. And I think in a sense, the days of the great heroic excavations where somebody went 15 metres in a few seasons but with a great gang of workmen. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, the Indiana Jones stuff, and I've, yeah. I can see your wonderful poster there. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. that, that period of time has gone. Yeah. Um, but we have a huge responsibility mm -hmm. to make the most of what was left, the legacy of those he heroic excavations. Yeah. Um, and to do that, you've basically got to sweat the small stuff, and pollen is about as small as it comes in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially what I do most of the time is incredibly dull, and it's about grinding out evidence. Mm -hmm. But just occasionally you get a glimpse of behavior yeah. and understanding behavior through other means than looking at artifacts and, if you like, things like burials. Yeah. I think is is one of the contributions we can make that previous generations just couldn't. No, it's one no. of the very good reasons to go back to old sites and really sweat them. Yeah. And typically, what we're doing is removing less than a cubic, less than a square meter of dirt yeah. um, from old faces, just enough to give us 
all that small evidence. Yeah. Well, um, actually, actually uh, uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed um, Peter Rowley Conway, and he said that one of the big things that he that is happening now, but also will be happening in archaeology, is not so much as you say the big excavations, but the hockey stick curve in terms of the ability to get more and more data from less and less evidence, and and what we do with that data and how we manage that data, and, and also, I mean, you mentioned going back to excavations, but also recently, for example, re reassessing. Uh, museum archives, for example, in Morocco, has pushed back, possibly pushed back Homo sapiens by another hundred thousand years in terms of uh, human remains, just by reassessing evidence. It mm. does seem to be important, yeah. And then, and and do, do you think that that's that would is that something that you that you reinforce in your students then? Um, I think one one has to talk about responsibility. Mm. I, I feel a really deep responsibility because this is such an important and actually has been so difficult to get at mm. sight mm. um you know, it was out of circulation through saddam's time and the wars that preceded yeah. that mm -hmm. um it, we came under threat from isis when they came towards Erbil, which is really not very far from where we are mm. um there and you can see the way that certain groups have treated important archaeology mm. not just there but in Afghanistan as well mm -hmm. we have a huge responsibility to our posterity mm. and one hopes that all students see that responsibility mm. um, it's not don't dig no. it's not don't do stuff it's mm -hmm. do it very carefully and make damn sure you archive stuff yes yeah absolutely Thank you. That's a wonderful point to end on. Um, again, thank you for your time this morning, and uh, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on this. And if, as and when anything, and you know, you, you you finish this immensely complicated project, I'd love to get back in touch with you. Um, well, we hope you. to be going back um, later this year. There's uh -huh. more remains that are ready to come out, as it oh. were. Um, and at the end of that, it's not just the bones, but it's also the the context in which things lie that yeah. will tell us so much um so it's an incredibly exciting and humbling thing to be involved with Wonderful. um and yeah i'd be glad to to talk to you again in the future excellent cool well thank you goodbye goodbye then bye bye <laughs>